and welcome to seven tips for building robust cloud applications. Now, cloud applications are very popular. There's a lot of them. And often I see little things that could be done a lot better in terms of promoting robustness and efficiency and you know, reliability. So that's what we're going to talk about today with seven tips. Yeah, I know. All right, let's get into it. Tip number one has to do with Azure App Services, in particular, deployment slots. So in general, friends don't let friends deploy to production, right? Mm, ever. Like, that's just bad. We all know that. And sometimes it's a little bit hard because hopefully we all pass the point where we drag files into the production server to do an update, right? We're way past that. We have automated processes and such on, uh, such things. But Azure does make it a lot easier. We want to eliminate accidental deployments. Like we don't like those. Whoopsies. Uh, those are the things where you deploy on Fridays. Don't do that. Um, and we want to provide a, a production-like QA because then we want to have confidence in that when we deploy to production, that the environment that we're deploying is as close to production as it can be so that our testing takes place in something that looks like production. And that is what Azure App Services deployment slots is meant for, especially around staging and QA. So let me show you. So here I am in the Azure portal. I've got an Azure App Service, and let me show you what deployment slots are. So on the left here on the menu, click on deployment slots. And you can see currently there is one, because you're always going to have one, right? That's called production. Now, you can add a slot, and you can add as many slots as you want. It just takes away resources from the App Service plan that you're on, or the VM. So add a slot. Give it a name such as staging. You can see underneath it's getting a unique URL just for this slot. So you can uh, target it specifically. And we're going to clone settings from our main slot. So you don't have to do that, but you can. I'm going to add that. Those settings are configuration things and stuff like that. And there we go. We've created a staging slot. And we close this. And now that is exactly like the production slot in every single way right now, but you can deploy directly to it when you are ready, when your staging seems to be ready for production, you tested it, everything is right, QA is happy, you simply click swap and you swap those two slots. It happens instantly, pretty much, uh, so there won't be any downtime at all. And then suddenly your staging is production and your production is staging the code in there. So the slots are still going to be called the same, but the code changes, right? That is how you use deployment slots to make a much more streamlined uh, deployment flow. Okay, so tip number two is also Azure App Services, but in particular this time we want to use the deployment slot for A-B testing. So A-B testing is effective. It's, it's very effective. It's, it's where you take two almost identical, say web services or websites in this case, and you change one thing on one of them, and then you guide traffic to both at a certain rate, you know, 50-50, 70-30, whatever you, you want to do. And you see what the difference is. So that could be making a button a different color. It could be moving the buy now button up to a corner or whatever it might be. But if you want to change something ever so slightly and test if there's an impact, A-B testing is great for that. However, it can be quite complex because you've got to set up two environments. You've got to you know, load traffic to go one way or the other. There's all those things to, um, to consider, but it might just increase revenue, right? So it's, it's a very valuable tool that we use for building efficient and robust uh, cloud infrastructures, but we can use Azure App Service deployment slots for that, which is something that not many know. So let me show you. We're back in the same app service and we're going to talk about A-B testing. And it's really simple. Usually A-B testing is really hard to do, but say you have the two deployment slots from before, right? So one's going to have one type of the production version, with say the blue button, one's going to have the red button or whatever it is that you're testing. And you want some traffic to go to one and some traffic to go to the other. All you have to do is change this traffic number here in the deployment slots. So say if I change this to 50, you can see that it automatically changes the other slot. Now, if you had three or four, you would have to obviously make it all be up to 100. But this is how you can do A-B testing very simply with app service deployment slot. That's all there is to it. I know. Yes. All right. Tip number three has to do with testing infrastructure. So when you let developers create their own testing environment, they just spin up a VM or they create an app service or they set up you know, Docker containers, whatever it is, and sometimes they forget or they create things they shouldn't have, etc. That's a problem. You know, sometimes they might not follow company policies. Another problem, like company policies are important. That's why we have policies, right? And 
maybe, just maybe, there will be cost blowouts due to this because you create a VM, you forget about it, it sits there spinning. And that is where dev test labs come into play. So let me show you how that works. I have here an instance of a dev test lab. And uh, this is what you see first. And basically, it's a way of managing a whole lot of resources, mainly virtual machines and disks. And you can see this is my dashboard. So each individual user will have their own dashboard when they log into Azure, be part of the dev test lab. I have currently a Ubuntu canonical machine, so I can click on that. And that'll give me an overview of that particular VM. And I can log into it like a normal VM. I can install stuff on it. I can use it. See, there's some auto shop there, a shutdown stuff. You know, it's just like a virtual machine that I can log into. If I go back here to the dashboard, uh, on the left here, as an example, you can see there are claimable virtual machines. So there is a pool of virtual machines. I've created two. I have one of them claimed. And then there's the other one in here, Red Hat 8 Node.js, is another unclaimed virtual machine that I can then click on. I can go over here. I can go claim it. And if I claim it, it's mine to use. So these are shared virtual machines. And that means that if someone else needs to use the virtual machine after me, I can unclaim it. They can claim it. They can do their testing on it and so on and so forth. And of course, you can use your own custom images for these uh, virtual machines so that you could have your own environment on it, developer environment, whatever it is you need to use. You could have um, something like Node.js. There are lots of different artifacts you can install on these base images. And all you have to do, if you want another virtual machine, and it uh, is allowed in the policy, of course, because it's all managed through policies, that's what we talked about before, so we don't get cost blowouts, for example, using virtual machines that are you know, out of policy. And here's a bunch of bases you can choose. These are all Linux in this case. Um, and then there's some SharePoints, trials, and there's a whole lot. You can see the scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. A lot of different base images that you can use uh, in your dev test lab. So that's dev test lab. It's a very good way of organizing your resources in a common way so that many developers can use the same resources and you don't suddenly have orphaned resources or resources that shouldn't be created in the first place. Hmm. Fourth tip is Azure function testing. Azure Functions are very popular. They're like the darling of the serverless world. But serverless testing can be hard, or so we think, right? Because it's someone else's server. Like, how would we know how to test someone else's server? But functions are just code, and we can test it. So let me show you how. So here's a sample Azure Functions project from Microsoft. And uh, it's just to show you that how easy functions can actually be done within, well, in this case, Visual Studio. You can use VS Code, you can use whatever IDE you want, depending on your language for your functions. I'm using C Sharp in this case. That's what I'm familiar with. And I have a standard function here. You can see there's a run method, which is always what initializes a function. And that does a thing, it gets a query parameter, and it prints out a name, something like that, right? Um, it says, hello. Now, there are some tests here, there are function tests. So that's just a test file within the project, within the solution. And you have, you know, a, some test cases here. And let's try and run the tests. So I'm going to go up to test so <laughs> in Visual Studio. I'm going to go to the test explorer. And in here, you can see that there are five tests. And I can run all those tests by clicking the button here. And this is all done locally. I don't have to connect to Azure. Um, all of the function runtime is on my computer. And there we go, it all uh, completed. If I expand them here, you can see that there are the five tests and we can see that they all passed. So it's really simple to create tests for functions, just like it is for any other piece of software that you wanna test. Um, and I highly recommend it. Tests are great, especially for functions because they only do one thing most of the time. So you won't need many tests to sort of, you know, cover the whole scenario of them. And um, they make your life much easier mm, and robust. Okay, so fifth tip, number five, is about application insights. And often we sort of go, oh God, what went wrong? If we find a bug, there's an outage, something like what actually happened? It's a problem sometimes on Azure because we can't install our own tools. Often we can have, you know, performance or debugging tools, but we can't just install them on an app service, for example. And then we also need to know maybe why it's slow, for example. Like what is the performance issues around these um, services on Azure. And that is where Application Insights comes in. So let me just give you, give you a quick overview because there's a lot to it. But um, um, yeah, here we go. 
So this is the dashboard for application insights for lastclick.com. So that's my website. There's a few stats here. You can see so response time, so request, fail request, etc. Um, application insights is a part of Azure Monitor and it lets you drill into any web app on Azure that it's enabled for. So you get an instance of application insight for each service that you enable it for. So this is for my website. And for example, on the left here, I can go into application map. And you can see that will show you here uh, the number of calls that are going into. So I have two deployment slots. I have a staging site and I have a, an actual site. Uh, that and I can drill in further, of course. I can see I can view the details here. And this is the whole idea of application insights. You can always drill down. Like It's an amazing amount of information. So, yes, I want to look at the get request. So that's for the um, you know, homepage of the website. And then you get a performance uh, metric here. You can see it's just going to load. All the get took six seconds. Oh, that's bad. Maybe here the get took two and a half seconds. So maybe that's slow. It runs on WordPress. Don't judge me uh, on Azure. But it might be something here that you want to change, something you want to um, maybe improve on. But you can see here the duration of the gets. Uh, there's something here, you know, workshops only took 0.02 milliseconds. That's pretty good. So that's the idea of application insights. You keep drilling down. There are other features on here, such as the smart detection, which is uh, an AI-based detection, actually, that tell that, that learns about your application and what's normal, and it detects things that aren't normal. So maybe you get some alerts for that. You can use live metrics, see what's coming in, coming out. And uh, you can drill down into failures. I don't have any failures right now. Um, but this, you just keep drilling down. You get the stack trays. You get uh, performance indicators. You get everything that went that happened and you can see if there's something you can fix or change or improve it's very cool As, you know application insights use it make your developers happy or if you're a developer you could be happy too okay number six is about performance let's start with websites websites have to be fast if they're slow they tend to die because people just lose patience uh, online users have very 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 little patience with websites if they're slow and they just go somewhere else and you might lose sales, for example. Uh, managing data is always critical. Data lives in databases and usually that's what makes it slow. Yeah, a website, or can be. So, you know, managing your data is critical and constant monitoring. Like you wanna know immediately if something goes slow. You, you wanna know if your website starts being slow or maybe it's the data. So, number six is I wanna show you a little bit about database performance tuning and monitoring. So, here we go. Oh, hello again. So it's important with databases that they perform well. We talked about this, right? Otherwise your site is slow and no one likes slow sites or applications. So um, here on the screen, I have the documentation for how to perform query performance insights for Azure SQL databases as an example. Now this requires a fair amount of data that I don't have in a test database. So that's why I'm sharing the documentation, but me and my friend Moose um, are going to show you this anyway. So you get this very nice um, overview of the CPU usage and the performance of your database if you go through this particular um, scenario or this particular you know, piece of documentation. Um, and as it says, it gives you the ability to drill down into details of a query, view the query text, or even the history of the resource utilization as an example. It's really, really powerful if you do have performance issues on your database. And you uh, do it by uh, initializing or using the query performance insight, which is on the database, and you do that by enabling a couple of things that are outlined in this documentation. And that gives you the ability to zoom in and out and completely slice and dice all the queries on the database that's being performed, figure out what isn't working properly, and you can fix it by then. So this is uh, quite in-depth, and it's uh, a lot of information on how to uh, optimize your database, but it's really well worth it, absolutely. And finally, number seven, whoops, seven. Um, talk about best practices because <sighs> architecture can be hard, right? It's not always that simple to build up an infrastructure in the cloud. So there are best practices that Microsoft has you know, recommended that are on their Microsoft Learn page you know, documentation. And they're really good. And there's all different kinds. There's IaaS, there's PaaS, there's you know, microservices. Um, so Microsoft can help. And um, yeah, let me just show you where they live and what they look like and why you should probably pay attention to them if you're building architecture. And finally, because we are talking about robust infrastructure and robust architecture for Azure applications, let's talk about best practices. And it's hard to know where to start because there's a lot of best practices and what's best for you may not be exactly best 
for someone else. So Microsoft has uh, given some examples of what could be considered best practices in different areas, and I have three of them here. So the first one is for IaaS, so infrastructure as a service, and there is a you know a template architecture here of how you might test for this and how you might move it into production. So you can see here on the screen, uh, there's a loop of development, so Visual Studio, GitHub, you know, Azure Pipelines, Azure Boards, and that feeds into a dev test subscription, which we talked about earlier, where you might have a bunch of different machines and VMs and whatnot that you use for testing your application. And then that goes into a production subscription um, where you have all of your production um, you know, resources, and that could involve something like application um, sorry, app servers deployment slots, for example, right? So that's one example of IaaS. And there's a whole bunch of information here of the data flow if you want to read more about it. And then there is for PaaS, so platform as a service, there is a uh, suggested architecture. It's very similar, but slightly different because it's PaaS. Um, and you can use that as well. And there's a specific example here with Azure App Services. Um, and that gives you a whole idea of how you might do a, a best practices implementation of a PaaS service or PaaS architecture. And again, the whole data flow is, is explained here as well. And then finally, everybody's favorite, microservices. So if you're considering microservices, there's another example here of how that might work for you and how you can use the Azure resources for creating a microservices uh, best practices infrastructure or architecture. And again, there's a whole bunch of Kubernetes stuff and whatnot here. I won't go into the detail, but the data flow is explained. So if you are after building robust applications in Azure, these are some of the best practices that Microsoft recommends that you use, or at least you know um, take inspiration from, to create a, a much better infrastructure for your particular project or application. There you go. All right, thank you. That was seven tips in 20 minutes. It was a bit quick, but I hope you got something out of it. At least you got a knowledge of what is available, what's possible for making robust applications in the cloud. If you want to know more, check out the links uh, in the resources for this talk. And in any case, thank you for watching. See you next time. Bye.